Okay, welcome to, back to our segment called The Fix um, with our EPs, uh, Chris and Tom. And Steve and I are going to chat with these guys about back pain today. So back pain is this weird thing where it can be super bad or not super bad or it just hangs around or we get it with some type of movement. But there is seems, seems to be some stigmas around back pain sometimes. What are some common themes and myths that you see with back pain when you see people? And we'll, we'll particularly talk about powerlifters and people who enjoy the, going to the gym today, not, not so much your general pop, pop people. What are some common themes like or myths you see with powerlifters? Mm, yeah, like I guess I'll start it off. Yeah. Like probably one of the biggest ones that I see is just going to be introducing movement to the back as quickly as we can. So like with most cases of back pain, like it hurts. We want to try and rest it. We want to try and let it recover. And that's fairly normal. Like for some people and some injuries, we do need that little bit of rest potentially just to let everything settle down a bit. But we do want to try and get backs moving as quickly as we can, just like any other injury or any other part of the body. So that's probably one of the biggest myths that we want to look at is not avoiding back training, but trying to actually introduce more back training when back injuries are present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one that I've found quite a lot and they teach it heaps at uni is if you're, if you have back pain, especially for lifters, uh, target your glutes and your core. That's like a big thing and a lot of anti-rotation stuff. Like I know that there was a big trend years ago, like doing pal off press, um, <laughs> clams, um, heaps of things like that to really, I guess, create more strength around the back, but not specifically training the back. So that sort of feeds into what Tom was saying about being able to actually train the back where we can and get the back moving mm -hmm. rather than focusing on say, for example, the core and the glutes, like they're both important muscles, but it's not so much that the focus needs to be on them rather than back as a whole. Mm. Yeah, so people come to you and they think that they need to train their glutes or they think they need to train their core more or yeah. they're scared to move or load the back. Yeah. yeah, so I guess a lot of the things that I've dealt with particularly is, I guess, building confidence with people, teaching them that it's okay to actually train their back in movements like extension. So a lot of the things that Tom and I do when needed for particular athletes is I guess really training the lumbar extensors. So for example, on the 45 back extension, a lot of people will sort of focus on squeezing the glutes as best they can and not so much coming into that full extension of the lower back, which we typically find is where people do lack strength. Mm. And if there's no strength or I guess musculature built there, then I guess to some capacity, they're gonna be weak there, right? So the better that we can teach them and build that confidence to teach them that the movement's safe and get them stronger there, uh, the better they are, I found. Yeah, and I guess even from like a psychological standpoint, just teaching people that it's good to feel your back muscles working because most people have an association of you feel your back working, it's a bad thing. But just like any other muscle, we want to get like good solid muscle pumps in there, especially if we're trying to work that muscle. So following on from what Chris is saying is training it in these deep positions of extension or flexion, just teaching them to feel it in a good way. So there's like two camps with, with powerlifting in general, camp thinking that, we don't need to train the back and camp thinking that we do need to train the back. Where do you think the thought process is coming from with not training, training the lower back with, with powerlifting in general? Mm, yeah. Like I guess it would potentially come from people thinking that squat bench and deadlift train all movements of the back evenly. So I guess like depending on the way you move, your leverages, the individual kind of structure of each person will dictate how someone moves in a lift. So it's very common for one person to potentially train all capacities or movements of the lower back, but one other person always misses certain parts of their lumbar training or like the hip training that kind of comes into that. And that's why we need to slot in those accessories that works on those small deficits that person might have. So I guess, yeah, it's, that's sort of where we find it's important to train the back because you find a lot of people that do present with these lumbar issues are missing certain aspects of their training in these particular parts of their back where they feel their symptoms. Where, which, which particular part of the back do you find that the, you get the most symptoms in? So I guess, um, <laughs> here's one really I'm really <laughs> So looking at this, I guess, at the skeleton here for those that are watching, um, if you're listening though, I guess we're looking more around that really low 
lower back area. So I guess sort of around here and the, that low lumbar area. Um, yep. Typically the areas that we've, I mean, that I've come across personally with a lot of the clients coming saying, you know, they feel really um, sore in either spot or both sides or coming up and down the spine as well. Um, I guess either from being too extended or too flexed um, from being pushed there from the bar. What do you mean when you say too extended or too flexed? Which areas? Of, of the lower back. Well, just in general, are you talking about uh, pelvis or are you talking about lower back in general? Like which areas are you speak when you say someone is too extended or they're too, too flexed? Which so, area are you looking at? So I guess for me, what I look at is, I guess, both the hips and the lower back because they can move, yep. they can, I guess, be pushed one way uh, separately or typically yeah. together. Um, so looking at, I guess, the lower back, we can see that when someone is, or has, I guess, lifted with their lower back um, in that more overflexed position, that's when they'll typically yeah. like round out a deadlift and yeah. sort of stretching sensation through that whole lower back where it's quite sore and then they um, feel like they can't really bend over or touch their toes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool, awesome. So what are some common themes you see with powerlifters in general when it comes to training their lower back or uh, lifting with lower back or getting lower back symptoms or do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. What are some, what are some common things that you see with, with people that like to lift, lift in the gym? Um, like I suppose one thing we do see is there's an interesting relationship between being able to go into full extension and then actually loading full extension with accessories. So what I kind of mean by that is like, let's take someone who arches a lot of bench press. Like they have a lot of lumbar, lower back arch. They have a lot of like middle back and upper back arch. So they're in a big position of extension. But when they're in that position, the barbell isn't actually loading their lower back, loading their erectors. So they're in a big extension arch, but they're not actually getting any muscle growth in that position. So then when you can see them train their lower back on something like a hinge or a 45 hyper or a GHR, and they come up into that same sort of extension position, they can't get there. They put themselves in extension when they're not, like, not loaded, but as soon as they're loaded, there's a lot of muscle weakness there. So that's something we can capitalize on with those accessories, teaching those people to train that bit in a loaded position. So then we get some muscle laid down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What about you, Chris? Um, could you repeat the question again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are some common themes that you see with lower backs with, with lifters in general? Like what, what are some common themes that you see with pain or common themes that you see with training or some, some things that they might might present with? Yeah. So I guess with lower back, what I've seen a lot of in the recent months is a lot of people finding that they um, are feeling quite tucked under or flexed on one side, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I guess more or less like one side of their pelvis or one side of their lower back feels like it's being pulled under quite a lot. So almost like there's like a bit of a rotation um, at their hips that can be coming from their lower back, uh, especially through like a deadlift or a squat, for example. So yep. if you've had an athlete say that they feel like they can't push too well or their squat feels quite twisted at the bottom, then yep. that can be stemming from, I guess, one side of their hips um, being a little bit more tucked. And what you can typically find, I guess, with that is that they'll express um, that they're getting that little bit of pain through that back of the pelvis where the pelvis meets that SIJ area on one particular side or potentially both. Yeah. So yeah. the way that we could look at going through treating that would be looking at trying to restore some hip extension through that one side to try to pull it back to meet the other side um, to make it feel, I guess, centered again and not as twisted or tucked. Yep. Yep. What are some things you would do for that? So for that, um, we'd look at potentially as, as best we, as best we can try not to give them uh, a split stance variation. If we can keep things as uh, bilateral as possible, that's best. But um, if that doesn't work, then doing something like a split stance RDL would work really quite well um, because mm -hmm. that will give us the ability to put the pelvis in a position that will help the low back feel better. Mm -hmm. um, along with also doing exercises that are going to help to build a lot of muscle mass in that spot. So um, uh, one that we like quite a lot because it does the job really, really effectively is using the back extension 
with yeah. some form of like foot elevation on the side that's affected. Because if we can do that, then what we're going to get is a lot more musculature being built in the spot or in the side that's more, um, I guess, tucked under than um, doing it bilaterally there because we're going to bias that elevation on that side. Yeah, right. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, that sounds really good. So I think everyone in this room's had an episode, uh, in this podcast has had an episode of low back pain, haven't they? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tom, <laughs> go through yours. <laughs> yeah. uh, me and low backs go way, way back. Like it's probably yeah. the best injury that's like occurred to me on and off just ever since I started lifting. And it's only very recently that I've got a handle of it when I start to understand backs more and more. And I guess like, yeah. oh, like kind of like Chris was saying, Mine was very much from one side of my body, just being always very flexed and under and being underloaded in those extension positions. So when I stressed it with something like a heavy deadlift, I could run into issues. Do you want to talk to us because you absolutely annihilated your back last year. <laughs> Do you want to talk us through what, what kind of when, you know, you had that big back injury last year, Tom, that you, your thoughts around backs changed a fair bit? Do you want to tell us what happened and 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 how you got yourself rehabbed really quickly and and back to lifting? For sure. So I guess like the the big thing that happened, I was just warming up for deadlifts. I was doing my last warm up, and just all of a sudden, as I after I wedged and picked the bar up, I just felt something. Like I just felt this pain, and just throughout the rest of that day, it just started getting worse and worse and worse, and to the point where that afternoon my leg had gone completely numb, and it was. Yep just un, like almost impossible for me to physically use the leg. Like I couldn't stand up, I couldn't load it whatsoever. Like I uh, had to move around on crutches, those kinds of things. So it was fairly intense. It was probably like the worst episode of my back pain that I've had ever, I guess. And it yeah. was just a matter of just, honestly, I needed to rest a little bit initially. Like I couldn't actually load anything at that point. So, but, yeah. so there was a lot of like um, just time in bed over that week. But the first yeah. thing I started doing is was I like whilst I was deloaded from gravity, I just started pushing that side of my hip up into extension, just doing what I could in terms of training that lower back, moving that lower back back up into the position that it didn't quite want to go into at that point. And I yeah. think it really helped a lot at trying to speed up the process because I was back able to move again pretty well and I was back under a barbell the next week just being yeah. able to train with some deloaded positions. And it was quite it was quite a scary incident initially when it was. And it was just one of those things where I was lucky enough to have knowledge and information on the back that I didn't push myself to go into any form of surgery or anything like that because it was a scary situation. So yours was like you were too flexed on one side? Yes, yeah, very much so. So my left side of my body had difficulty achieving any form of lumbar or hip extension. So when I loaded myself in a position of quite a lot of strength in lumbar and hip extension, I wasn't able to hold that. I believe that's where I incurred the injury. Okay, cool. And what are some things in your program now that you, you call, that we call non-negotiables that, that you, you need to have constantly doing so you can keep strengthening that left side? Um, I do a dumb amount of hinging, like it's ridiculous. Like I will do um, sort of like an amount of like eight by eight on RDLs two to three times a week, um, just to maintain as much lumbar extension strength as possible. And it works a treat. Like it was one of those things where I thought initially I was just doing enough for what my movement patterns needed. But just after that injury, I kind of realized how much exposure um, to that hinge I really needed. And that's one of the things I've implemented since then. So lots of back extension work, lots of hinging work, really trying to improve my hinge capacity on that side and just yeah. increase how much strength I have in my lumbar erectors on that side. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. What about you, Chris? Uh, in terms of my own back pain episodes? Yep. Um, yeah, I, I roasted my back. <laughs> A while ago, um, I was trying to, I guess, be be the big brother and show my brother that I could squat heavier than him. And, yeah. and <laughs> in doing so, I sort of made myself look like a question mark under the bar. And um, I, I felt a big pop in my lower back and I was walking around like I was 70 years old at the age of 17. So yeah. it was really good for me. And um, 
I guess at the time, because I had really like no knowledge surrounding how to help treat my back or anything like that. I didn't seek help with a physio or anything either. I just sort of tried to do as much as I could comfortably. Yep. Um, and I think the thing that helped me the most, cause I was playing a lot of footy at the time. The thing that helped me the most was actually all the running that I was doing because that yep. for me from going, I guess one extreme of being super flexed under the bar to going into more of an extended bias movement, like running his, um, yep. really helped push me back the other way as uncomfortable as it was initially. Um, I think that that was for me, the thing that helped along with also continuing to try to <clears throat> create as much, I guess, extension where I could. So I was still trying to do as much um, resistance training as I could at the time, um, but yeah. things weren't painful, I guess. So using pain as a guide in that sense, but yeah. if I was to look back uh, now and treat myself, I would um, straight away get me onto doing some back extensions and movements that are, I guess, heavily extension biased because of the mechanics of the injury that happened. Yeah, yeah, because you do have quite a flex squat. Yes, yes, <laughs> quite a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess for a question for you and Steve, what are some common things that you guys both deal with or hear from your athletes when they are starting to experience like niggles and aches and things like that with their backs? Because I'm assuming it'd be um, quite a lot you know, over the course of your coaching careers. Yeah. Steve? Uh, most, of, I get, like we're going to hear, we hear about it a lot, right? And most of the time it's just like people feeling their back and there's just like big fear yeah. around like if the back hurts, then we're not going to be able to do things or live uh, life like to the fullest, right? And most of the time it's, I've found not to be very serious. Um, I don't dismiss it whatsoever, but it's mm -hmm. more like, we're going to feel it like you said like it's not a bad thing right uh like yep. tom said earlier like we need to be able to be more acceptive of feeling the back through movement especially through the three lifts uh and then you know if if it is starting to affect other things uh outside of lifting you know general life like i can talk all day about how my back sore quite frequently but away from that like what we're hearing like it's a lot of it will happens like accumulation right towards the end of blocks people start to to mention it a bit more like i'm starting to feel my back or my back hurts or i feel it more when i'm like deadlifting or the big thing of like um i can't feel my legs all i can feel is my back like that mm -hmm. that that can be quite frequent as well uh and especially especially when like uh i suppose people start to get a bit tired like i said towards the end of the block like fatigue starts to come up so yeah. you know they're obviously I would say getting a bit lazy, but it's like the push is starting to dissipate and it's like, it's got to, we got to, we can almost come in from like a programming point of view and be like, okay, like this is generally when this is starting to happen. So it's like something, we're just going too far. And it's like, yeah. that's just all that person can handle. And then, you know, their, their hips might start to, you know, get into an abnormal position or something. And then their, their back starts to flare out. So it's like, we can only go this far before we got to pull it back before they start to feel this again, because then we'll notice that, Oh, I've noticed that people will start to spiral, right? Because they start yeah. to feel some kind of back pain. They will spiral, be you know a bit neurotic with the thinking. They'll just think. And then when someone's feeling something too, they feel for it. And then mm -hmm. that most of the time that makes things worse as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I guess that's the biggest thing. And then just being able to you know program around it. Like you said, like we need to program, like have hinging and extension in program, but you know that some people will need to flex as well. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just uh, figuring out what works for each individual. Yeah, I'll piggyback off that. And I think the biggest thing that Steve just mentioned is we need to assess really quickly where it's coming from, from the athlete and how bad the athlete thinks it is in, and what their preconceived, um, what their preconceived behaviors are with their back. Um, because, uh, you know, some, some athletes will feel it at particular times. Some athletes have a big, big um, pass with their back. Some athletes don't really understand load management and their back. Um, so understanding where the athlete is, is really important. And also uh, it depends on where they are in prep, but if there's someone who needs, you know, uh, that someone who, who, who may, who may feel that at the end of the block, they may need a little bit more of a bigger deload compared to somebody else and stuff like that. So a lot of it, a lot of it for us is load management. And I think um, one big thing that I'm working with myself a lot is exactly what Steve said is 
recognizing when we've gone when it's on the cusp of going too far and then making adjustments in the program mm. and that's a big one especially with peaking and then um with chronic for us it's for for me i've got a couple of guys who are quite chronic um to the point of the whole program has needed some constraints so just understanding that how to put the constraints in with still getting specificity and enough stimulus to get some type of strength strength adaptations is pretty tough um but it's doable it's doable with communication yeah it just takes a while so i guess that's the biggest thing thing for coaching and then understanding when to refer yeah yeah that's it so knowing when to refer is also a big one and knowing when you're in when you're in but i think with backs in general if you're if you've got good communication with your athlete you should be able to from a coach it, we can understand what what they're going through and what changes need to be made at that time yeah at the same time it's like how well the athlete can communicate it to you yep. as well like what, yep. they're, what they're feeling like there's nothing harder from a coaching point of view when someone just says like my back hurts or all i feel is my back like that makes it really hard like it really hard yeah it's we need some sort of explanation of like how throughout the movement and stuff like that because else it's just like you know it's like saying that your my quad hurts but like you know there's like six different muscles right yeah like when through the movement does it does it hurt so that's when things can get hard um but yeah. it's also sometimes just being bring people off the edge right because back pain is one of those things that people sort of freak out about and i know like a lot of times if we get like the acute kind of injuries that just like popped up like um tom's and chris is like they spoke about earlier and i've had the same before like most of the time we can't really help like those pops in the back and then you can't walk the next day like yeah. they're pretty unavoidable right like Give it a rest. it's just yeah you just don't know it's coming and then it just happens like i've had it a lot of times um and it's just uh like it, i'm used, used to it happening now which uh, isn't like a good thing but it's happened that many times that i know not to freak out now is what i'm saying and we have the ability like more and more as sports science gets better and better to have a much faster turnaround when they do happen. So it's like, oh, yeah, well, the last time that like my back sort of popped in a deadlift for me was oh, like maybe a month and a half ago. And I deadlifted a day later. All right. Like it was just like, just acknowledging that I knew how to kind of make it better. And it wasn't like bad, like the first time or something had happened. And, you know, I didn't have like that, like my, I didn't stress out about it. I didn't freak out or anything. So I didn't have any of those external stresses affecting the area. Right. Like it was just like, I was like, Oh shit. Okay. <laughs> that, that, I felt that. And it was like the next day I just tried again and just understood that it's probably not going to get worse. And, and if, but if it, if it was feeling worse, I was acknowledging that and then, you know, going back, but getting through it still. Right. And no, nothing got worse than anything. I got better quicker because of it. Yeah, like I guess that's probably one of the most important things with just handling any form of recurring back injuries is feeling confident in yourself to keep loading and keep moving it like you did. Just jump yeah. and be like, no, I'll be right. And then just going for it and yeah. playing it by ear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I think that, keep going, Chris. I was just going to say, um, I think that's where we can implement those non negotiables that we were talking about earlier. Because if we can chuck them into the program, um, say, for example, at the at the back end of the deadlift day, if, you know, we know that there's a history of things happening on a deadlift day, then we can push the athlete to feel, I guess, a lot better going into the following training days um, using exercises that are for them. Yeah. Um, so, Steve, with your past, how you didn't do much hinging at all, how have you found this prep with your back, with adding in all the hinging that you've been doing for this prep? Have you um, like, yes and yeah like but i'm i did i'm sore right i don't, I don't feel healthy like I feel, i'm healthy but i feel i feel my good sore i yeah. feel my back every day at the moment like even just sitting here i'm feeling my back yeah um, but it, it doesn't feel bad um but i haven't had the the um like the deadlift heavy deadlift a few weeks out where my whole back goes kind of thing um yeah i haven't had no no pops or any i have had one but nothing 
severe. Like I said, like I was back in the next day and I was fine to go again. Um, yeah. It just, it it feels dommy all the time, my back at the moment, uh, bending over, doing anything, um, but I'm not phased by it at all. Yeah. But I haven't had the acute pull, pull me out of a session kind of feeling that I've had in previous preps before. That's good. Uh, that's I guess that's good. that's the biggest difference is I actually, I, like I feel my back all the time right now, like um, sitting down, laying down, st- walking around. Um, I feel it. Yeah. But uh, it's not... It's not affecting me negatively, um, and I don't I don't mind feeling like I'm sore and like I've been training hard. Like that's good. That means I'm working hard for me. You know, that means I like that feeling. Yeah, you probably um, would you liken it to feeling the compressed in your back feeling at the moment? A little bit, yeah. Um, that that is that super compressed feeling too. Like you've like overdone it. Yeah, and then you can't fucking breathe. <laughs> <laughs> But it's 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 nowhere near that. I think, um, That's cool. I think one thing that I've, I guess, taken note of, because um, Tom and I would have been discussing this recently, is since implementing a lot of hinging or helping Steve with all of his hinging in the last few months leading into coming to Malta, um, we've noticed that in his squat, he's nowhere near as tucked or flexed when at the bottom of the squat either. So he's actually holding a lot more extension, which is really good because then that gives him more ability yep. to actually push and I guess um, to some capacity be stronger in the position and hold that position a bit better than being too flexed. Yeah. Which I guess is a really positive benefit from all the hinging Steve's been doing too. How many sets a week are you doing at the moment now? Me? Um, yeah. Like three a day? Yeah. So three Five a day. Six days? Yeah, so three a day, six days, 18 sets a week. Yeah, so, and then 45s on top of that three times a week. Yeah, so just to put that into perspective of people who are listening, if you have had, uh, if you someone like Steve who has a, a, a history of the acute episodes at the end of preps, that's how much hinging and back extensions he's been having to do for this whole prep? Ah, uh, just for ages. Before <laughs> prep. Before prep for even. ages. Well, Prep hasn't just been the last six weeks, right? It's been since nationals. I've yeah, almost incorporated time. this. So yeah. that's that's been seven, eight months. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's just to put it into perspective for, for, for people who are listening, how much of that this extension work, if you are someone who who is prone to this type of acute stuff, is needed in programs to actually get that response. Yeah. I, I'm not telling people to go and do 18 sets of hinges a week, but I'm just saying that. If if your if your coach programs you hinging multiple times a week, there's a reason why. Probably yeah, I think it's it's yeah. also acknowledging like how flexed I was in my squat, right? Like yeah. I'm putting two hundred and fifty plus kilos on my back a couple of times a week and I pick it up off the floor yeah. in a flex position. Like I need to go the other way sometimes. Yeah. Like I yeah. think yeah. it's kind of try and round us out. So it makes sense that we need to train to get the other way. Yeah. <laughs> What are, what are, what's the difference? One thing before we finish, what is the difference that you guys that you guys see with people that or lifters and powerlifters that present with chronic back pain and then acute episodes? So we've got those who come in saying my back's been hurting for six months. You know, it hurts every time I deadlift and I squat and I can't get rid of it. But and then you have the guys who at the end of their preps something. Too much has gone too far. What's the differences you see? I guess um, for me in particular, I guess the big difference I've found is that those that have the acute more than the chronic um, will be more debilitated than those that have the chronic. So what I mean by that is like, you know, the like for example, if you've been pulled too far one way or pushed too far one way with a squat or a deadlift and they're coming in saying, you know, I can't walk too well or I can't bend over, I feel really stiff and stuck um, in that acute stage then they're typically, I found a bit easier to manage um, and to fix, I guess, the issue rather than those that are chronic because for those that have had chronic, um, in my experience, are able to push through training a lot more. Like they'll feel good some days and some things will make them feel better, but it always just lingers around. Um, I'm not sure, like, what have you found? Yeah, that's pretty similar. It's like, um, I guess, yeah, the acute um, back pain episodes, they tend to come up after something. Like it might be more towards the end of a prep or more towards the end of a block and you just do something that's heavier than you've ever done in that block. 
and it just exposes you to a position that hey, maybe you weren't quite ready for, maybe it's too big of a load jump or something like that. Whereas yeah, chronic can just be one of those things where it's just it's kind of just always there dull in the background. Um, both can very much be fixed. They're just slightly different. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, sweet. So what were you, if you were to, if you were to prescribe a couple of exercises for someone that was chronic, it would be more of the just get back in loading type thing? Yeah, potentially. Like I, it's always very much individual depending on the person that's in front of you. But yeah. I guess like the big thing with chronic is we want to make day-to-day -day feel better first. Like if someone's got yep. back, they're just going to be getting like sick of it. So we want to try and make the day-to-day -day life feel much better as best as we can within our control. And then yep. we that feel better more in the gym whereas acute tends to be more specifically very much gym related it's very reactive after like a big lift or something so we want to try and just like re-expose them back in the gym as quickly as we can but it's yep. very yeah okay cool what were you gonna say chris i was just gonna say i think that um a big thing that i found is that a lot of hinging is needed like we we're talking about with steve um just as a general rule i like to use hinging um, but obviously based on the individual giving a constraint that's applicable. So for example, they might need like a heel elevation or a toe elevation or, yep. um, you know, a split stance if needed, um, just depending on how they present. But I, I do think yeah. hinge is quite important because it loads the structures in a way that we need it for powerlifting. Yeah. And what's the difference between heel elevating and toe elevating a hinge? So just, you go. So just change which muscles you feel and which muscles you use and where your center of mass goes. The you know, center of mass just kind of helps us pick and choose what muscle we're going to load in the movement. So yep. if it's a little bit more toe elevated, we're probably gonna use more of our pushing muscles like our erectors, maybe our quads, maybe our adductors, something like that. And then yep. if it's heel elevated, it might be more focusing on lengthening off those structures and shortening more stuff like hamstrings. So we just like to use that to pick and choose what muscles someone might need a bit more of in that situation. Okay. All right, cool. So I think that gets a little bit confusing for some people. Yeah. Whether you I I, keep going. I think a big thing too is acknowledging whether someone needs more extension or more flexion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's a huge thing. Like, because it, it is such an extension based sport. If people move, um, that way, and then it's like we need to, like I said, like I I'm so flexed, I needed to go the other way, right? And then I start extending from fucking the weirdest places when I was first hinging, right? Like I was. I was extending from my neck when I thought I was extending from my lumbar. A lot of people do like, that. <laughs> like, and I couldn't even, feel, I can't even feel it. Right? I can't even feel my body starting to just wanting to flex the whole time. So I think a set of eyes on watching someone hinge is a big thing too. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. I've, I've realized that anyway, like, because when I can't feel what my body's doing because I'm pushed so far one way because of the amount of load that I've, have moved for such a long time like i literally can't feel it i can't feel myself lose it all i can't feel myself going to that flex position i still feel like i'm extending as much as i can and yeah i just wasn't yeah, yeah. and then when i recorded i was like wow whoa, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah i was like this is not what i'm feeling <laughs> all right um to finish off today can you guys one of you guys just go through a case study that you've worked with recently with a, an episode of back pain uh, what you went through with that lifter, what, what the assessment was like, what the prescription was like, the progression, and what happened in the process. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I saw <clears throat> I saw one of Steve's clients uh, two, three weeks out from one of his competitions. Um, really acute episode of low back pain. He felt it during a deadlift on his second rep. Um, yep. And yeah, just literally was feeling like he was so flexed and couldn't walk. Was walking, I guess, like I explained earlier, or described earlier, like a 70 year old, um, really feeling quite tucked and everything. So during the assessment, we just went through range of movement, um, seeing where he was lacking and how much range of movement he had and what was painful or pain-free. Um, and then the first thing that we looked to do is just restore that range straight away as quickly and I guess effectively as possible. So that way we didn't really um, limit the load on the bar too much or leave kilos on the bar because he was i guess approaching that important part of the block where we need to make sure that we're pushing as much load as we can coming into comp right um so substituting squats for things like the belt squat where we can still keep load in the legs was really helpful and then um 
relearning or, or teaching him how to hinge again while trying to hold some form of extension through his lower back um, was also really beneficial. So um, what, what did you find? So he heard he's on a deadlift, so he overflexed on a deadlift, right? Yeah. What did the deadlift look like? It barely was, made it off the floor. Yeah. <laughs> barely made it off the floor because after the second rep, oh, sorry, on the second rep where he was pulling, um, he essentially like scooped and tucked the deadlift quite a lot. So for those that I guess can't visualize it too much, it's almost thinking about, I guess, tucking your, tucking your hips under the bar and trying to really lift the bar off the floor with your glutes instead of pushing with your legs. And then pushing it with your heels. Yeah. 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 Instead of wedging into your toes. Yeah. Yeah. And then when you, so when you assessed him from that, for, when you assessed him, what, what were you looking for? to see that he didn't have enough extension or he wasn't able to extend. Yeah. So going through, um, I guess, movements like uh, the straight, a straight leg raise and um, face down hip extension are really good indicators for us that we like to use to see how much extension someone actually has or where their hip flexion is at. Because typically if they've been super tucked or flexed in one position, they'll be quite good through um, the straight leg raise because that's more of a hip flex position. So they'll have yeah. that because they are more tucked, but then they'll find that um, they'll still feel that sensation through the lower back. And then going through that prone hip extension or the face down hip extension, they'll find it really quite difficult and probably feel some of that sensation through that lower back again um, because their body's just fighting them um, to create that hip extension. Just doesn't want to do it. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. So, what did you do for this? What did you do for this guy? Because he was three weeks out. So, how did you keep load on the bar? And did he PR in this comp? I think he did. Yeah, he did. He PR'd and he pulled. Did he pull two ninety? I think he pulled. Yeah, but he did. He fucking didn't didn't listen to the down call. He didn't listen to the down call, but he did pull two ninety. So, if you listen to the down call, it moved really easy. Yeah. So what? That's the biggest thing here. So how did you three weeks out get this guy pain free to the point where he still PR'd on the platform? So working with Steve um, through the micros leading into the comp, um, adjusting where needed, and I guess adding constraints to exercises. So like I mentioned earlier, um, squatting him where he was comfortable with the bar, but then yep. substituting volume on belt squat was a really good one because that kept volume in his legs and helped him, I guess, create more of a pushing pattern, but then restoring extension where we could on things like the back, the 45 degree back extension um, and getting him to hinge a lot. So I was getting him to hinge, I think every set before every session um, and then beginning deadlifts off of mats as well, and then progressing to the floor. So that progressed really quite quickly because he was smashing all of the back extensions and, um, the RDLs pre-session. So he restored his range of movement really quickly. And I saw him the week after. Um, and he's already deadlifted, right? Deadlifted yeah. and squatted. Deadlifted, mm -hmm. I think he deadlifted up to 220 that weekend. Yep. And squatted as well. Um, I remember what he squatted, but yeah, the first few days uh, by substituting in the belt squat and the deadlifts off mats helped, I guess, restore that range of movement and get more load onto um, his body leading into comp, which then, you know, flowed really well into his peak. Um, yep. And Steve worked his magic with the program as well, adjusting it as needed. Yeah. That was just a lot of communica good communication on his end as well, like letting me know how he felt um, as he was going. And I'd be like, okay, let's, can you, can you try this with the barbell while you're going, when you're squatting, um, work up to this. And then if you start to feel anything, it's still a win because we've got, you know, up to X load on the, on the barbell and then we'll get yep. the rest of the stimulus in through the belt squat for the rest of the session. Um, I had to be quite available, but it, it you know, in someone's peak, right? Like that's kind yep. of how it is. And if they're dealing with an acute injury like that, um, we want the best result possible for them. Yeah. Yep. I think one of the biggest things to take home from that is when it is so acute in a peak that you can really turn around and have the person back under the barbell within days. Yep, so yeah. Not, it's not game over, especially if it's something that is just that one rep or that one session that's overloaded. Why do you think why do you think that is? So sometimes Me? Anybody. Answer. Um, <laughs> so Tom Tom just Tom just murmured. I think sometimes <laughs> shit just happens. Yeah. <laughs> it just um, happens. But I think ultimately because the body goes through like, I guess, from more of a 
a biological perspective, it, the body just goes through an event that sort of just hypersensitizes everything. So it's sort of just like, shit, I can't move. I don't want to be in pain. So everything's just sort of going off. Alarms are going off left, right and center. So the body sort yep. of up around the area that's affected. But if we can as quickly as possible, like we've mentioned throughout this podcast, get the body moving as, as comfortably and as pain-free as possible, as soon as possible, um, all those uh, senses that the body has going off die down and then we can actually restore movement um, properly and get strength yeah. back into the body as soon as possible. Yeah. 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 So, I think, right, well, like when it's, because it seems to happen quite frequently in peaks, right? Yeah. And I think it's just the extra stresses of fatigue accumulation and, and everything like that. Yeah. And then it's like, I can tell you right now, the person, Nick, that hurt his back when he deadlifted, um, pulled 270 or something for a single and then went to like PR or triple after by like 30 kilos. It was like the, we almost get this like almost feeling of we're not as strong as we need to be, but and then we put something kind of silly on the bar, yeah, and that wasn't needed, right? And then that that happens, but it's like an accumulation of everything's like going up at the same time, intensity's going up, volume's yep. going up, everything's going up, so the, all the stress is coming in, and then we're almost like like I've said before in like other podcasts, we're we're running a fine line almost in a peak, right? Of like not going too far in terms of like crossing that threshold of like maximum recoverable volume and intensity that we can be doing. Like we're almost like we're, we're, we're hitting the door, right? We're, we're really yeah. tapping on that. And sometimes if like one little move can go wrong, it just like tips you over that edge. So it's like, yeah. so it, it happens way, way less frequently than it, than it um like doesn't happen. Right. Like, yeah. It doesn't happen very often. If we think about how many people we work with and how often this has happened, mm -hmm. uh, it's not that often, but it, it, we do run a fine line sometimes. And I think that's just what happens. It's just stress is really high, fatigue's high, uh, and we ju it just accumulates. And then, like, the tiniest little movement. Yeah. Bang, so, or the, 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 like Tom said, shit happens. Yeah, that increase in volume, that's, that sharp increase in volume. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard because, as you say, athletes just want to put load on the bar. Yeah, right. Especially someone like Nick, like he wants to be strong, so he feels like he needs to keep doing more. And then it was just a, just yeah. a one of those those moments, right? Yeah, 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 definitely. All right, I think that'll do us for today. Um, do you guys have anything more to add to that? No, no, I think we covered much covered. Covered it, covered it. I think the big things are. Figure out what you don't have and give more of that the opposite. <laughs> yeah, it's almost, it's almost, uh, there's negotiables and non-negotiables in the program. The um and then uh communicating with coach, big one. Yeah, big one. Like, think of people as like those bendy rulers, right? And if we just bend them too far one way, they'll be stuck that way. So we need to bend yeah. them back sometimes. Your <laughs> spine is a bendy ruler. Fucking group up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks guys. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs>